You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to another round of Snarky Faith the Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney, and welcome here again as we will descend here talking about issues of Christianity and faith and peppering it in with a bunch of snark. Because really the only way to be able to handle religion right now in 2020 America is why a little sarcasm is needed. It's necessary. It is necessary. At least that's what I'm doing right now. So, hey, everyone out there, how's your week going? I hope it's going well. There's been a lot of craziness amongst the COVID times that we're living in. Yep, states are still getting people getting sick. Huh? I thought if we just ignored it like an old girlfriend, we could just ghost it away. Bye-bye, COVID. Yeah, it doesn't really work that way. It doesn't work that way. But in the midst of where we are at in this very unique time in human history, we get lots of real news. We get lots of fake news. We get a lot of everything in between. I wanted to at least begin this show. I mean, come on. This is a show about religion and about faith. So we might as well start. We might as well start with truth. Truth of the word of God. No, not really truth of the word of God. I just found something this week that is very truthy for everyone. Because here's what I'm going to show you. Uh, As we start off the show, I thought I was so... I was so bowled over by this, this one act of honesty. This, this one act of absolute honesty within the life of a church, right? So, like, churches, they like to say they preach the quote-unquote truth, but this, 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 this is truth. This is absolute truth, and this bit of truth that I just thought was so amazingly honest and refreshing. And I'll share my other thoughts on it afterwards. Comes from Sugartown. That's right. Sugartown United Pentecostal Church. And the man speaking his truth. His truth. Which, 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 which. which. Again, I'm not even telling you what I'm showing you yet, but I just got to build this up a little bit. So just kind of go with me here. But see, Pastor Tim, Pastor Tim Dearson, has a truth that he's going to share. And what I'm going to go ahead and tell you is the truth that he's going to share is something that 99% of pastors in America want to say every freaking week in church. But only, only Pastor Tim is going to do this at the Sugar Town. United Methodist Church place we get really real we want the real word of God so I'll quit teasing you I'm going to give you just a little bit of the beginning of Pastor Tim's message as it's Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now here I'm very happy that each one of y'all are here this morning but here's where I'm not happy this morning I want you to look around. Look around this morning. We have Sister Dana and Sister Tanya. They're going on vacation. Sam and Bethany and their family is not here. Michael and Destiny and their family is not here. Sister Marlene is not here. Pete and Jean is not here this morning. Uh, Miss Barbara is not here. 
Uh, Sister Dolores is not here. Kevin Keegan and his family is not here. Sister Karen, Hannah, and some of the children is not here. Brian and Shannon is not here this morning. Sister Tyler and her children is not here. Robert and Kaylee Morgan and uh, River is not here. Jody, Heather, and Eli is not here. Jeremiah, Kirsten, and their family is not here. Dear Lord, Sugarland, Louisiana has done been shookted. It's been shookted up. Oh, man. <laughs> yes, apparently. 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 Good Lord. And yes, I can speak a little bit of Louisiana because I've got grandparents that live there or had existed there when they were on this plane of existence many years ago. But man, Sugartown United Pentecostal Church of Pastor Tim, keeping it real. But <laughs> I love it. I love it. Not really. I think it's terrible. <laughs> but I love how they're having church in the middle of the pandemic. And on the live stream, he's also calling out members of the church who didn't show up for church. Because we like to shame people now because of science. COVID. It's just, I mean, really, the way we're at the place now in America now. Do you believe in faith in Jesus or faith in science? And that's not, that's not by any means any kind of <laughs> religious or faithful stance that anyone should be taking. It's just, you know, it. Uh, what do you want this week, huh? Are you interested more in water or air? Because you can only have one. <laughs> you got to choose. Why do we do this? What is up with these weird binaries uh, within the faith? Why can't we be a people of faith but also respect science, right? There's a pandemic. Maybe if I want to get my church on, I'll just do it from home. I don't want my church being a total a-hole and calling me out on live stream for not showing up. Maybe somebody, Pastor Tim, had a tummy ache. Who knows? Flat tire. Maybe it was Satan. But either way, give him a friggin' break. What is going on here? But that 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 is a great place for us to be able to start out into today in Starkey Faith. And and later in the show, we're gonna get into a new segment we're doing with liturgy. And and I love the idea. Like I, I love being able to kind of take some of this synthesis <laughs> that they're doing here in the church and apply it to something else. Like, like now we're gonna have a reading of the word of the Lord. And we'll say this, yes, today. Lord, hear our prayers. Except for if you're Renee, Johnny, Francesco, Susan, uh-uh, uh-uh. You're not in on this corporate prayer because you're not here, so suck it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I love, I love all this. I love all this. I love it just because it's ridiculous, not because it's true. Like, I think that people are probably mentally demented if they continue to go to a church like Sugar Town United Pentecostal Church in Louisiana. I'm sorry, Louisiana. Louisiana. It's my parents with the accents, not me. Um, which, fun fact, my wife, who was born in Chicago, if she spends time around my parents, will develop more of a southern ac accent than I do when I spend time around my southern parents. Go figure. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and raised there. So, mysteries abound. All right, getting back to the point of why we're here today. And every day. No, <laughs> why we're here today. So, we have been continuing over the past few weeks. We have been uh, moving through, I'm not going to call it a study. I think it's just a jaunting, a, a hop scratching um, through a book called Tug of War from Wilmer Villacorta, one of my old uh, professors. Um, and we've been talking about different ways that we hold and look at and value leadership in the church and beyond. So we're going to continue there today as we hop into the meat of our show. So we'll be talking more and more about that and, and, and just getting out a little bit of house cleaning as we do this because, hey, I'm trying to turn over new leaves. <laughs> so this broadcast and all other past broadcasts you can find on podcasts 
um, at www.snarkyfaith.com and anywhere that you get your podcast. So just look up Snarky Faith. We shall be there. If you are a regular listener and haven't done so over on iTunes, come on, give us some love in the form of a rating. Uh, write a review. Give us some love. It's always appreciated because it's kind of good. You got to counteract. I think we just had really, we had mainly positive ones and then you get a couple of dissenting opinions and then I cry for two weeks and can't move on. No, <laughs> if you enjoy it, write it. If you don't, don't. It's fine. I don't mind. But uh, but if you also enjoy this show and want to get it delivered to your inbox on a weekly basis, you can sign up for our regular newsletter at snarkyfaith.com. Um, and also something that we have done that I have, it's like a garden untended to for the longest time. I tried this months ago and then forgot about it. Even though I have literally where I record this from, I have a post-it note taped. No, no, no. Not just post-it noted, taped because the post-it noting goo came off. I have it literally taped on top saying the Snarky Faith Hotline. So Snarky Faith Hotline is a place if you want to be able to, to get your voice on the air, if you want to give thoughts, opinions, or whatever else, if you want to clap back, go for it. Because, hey, Snarky Faith, I love, I love, I love them both. I love to hear your criticism. Sometimes I can grow from them. <laughs> Sometimes I can just laugh at them. And from others, I have I have gained many amazing and awesome friends from this process as well, too. So, 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 if you want to reach out, positive or negative, I'm always available. Questions at snarkyfaith.com. And also, if you want to end up on the air, there's the snarky hotline. I know, it's like the bat phone. I have it in my room. It's red. It lights up when someone calls on it. That's not true at all. It'd be awesome if it was. Uh, 919-525-1570. That's right, 919-525-1570. That is the Snarky Hotline. Why would you call that? Will I answer? No, I won't. But we have it set up for you to leave a voicemail where you want, you can share, kind of whatever the heck you want to share, pretty much, for the most part, yeah. And in the past, 98% of the stuff that pops up on there ends up on the show. So even if you're one of those, you can still get on the show. And you know who you are. I don't need to even say who you are, but you know, you know, you know. Well, as we hop into this episode, like we do in so many previous episodes, the one thing that prevents us, it's the impediment or, 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 or it's, 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 it's kind of like the trebuchet. Anyone? Are we getting a little bit too, okay, trebuchet or less fancy catapult that sends us into our main story, we have the Christian Crazy of the Week, where we go through and skewer through the craziness, the insanity of Christianity in the world today. Why, why, why do we do this? Because mockery is fun? Sure. Is that why we do it? No, because I could just do that in my own head. We do this to be able to push and pull at where the church is today in America. Because guess what? <laughs> Most of this craziness has nothing to do with Jesus. And that's why we like to roast it. So without further ado, here we go. Christian crazy time. Let's go. Claude Hammers, the Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. Kicking off the top of the Christian crazy this week is, is actually, I mean, I kind of feel like my job here, at least in our portion of the show, they called the Christian crazy. I'm kind of like, I'm like one of those old men up in the hills looking for gold. I'm panning for gold here. Do I have some? Oh, I found a nugget. Yeah. So the nugget we found here in the Christian crazy is essentially how to fix racism in America. I mean, <laughs> I know, I know you've been waiting for this. For years. And I promised it in one of my prophecies back in 2001. Where I no, I did not do that. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so so we hear in our joke segment of our show, The Christian Crazy, have the cure for racism in America. I'm not even going to say that I'm saying that sarcastically because I'm trying to educate some people because there are some people that listen to the show that do not understand the word snarky and the word sarcasm, but you know. 
You can't help them all. So Andrew Womack, who is a televangelist, TV pastor, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't stand up enough because I think if you're a televangelist, you got to at least stand up with a microphone. Womack likes to sit down in a chair, so he's just kind of a, he's like a lazy evangelist. But Andrew Womack has figured out, uh, you know, he doesn't like all this fuss over race and protesting and everything else, but I mean, he's a brilliant man because he's figured out what we all need to do to fix it. My wife wanted to watch uh, Driving Miss Daisy last night. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see this? Yeah, sure did. Yeah. I watched it three nights ago. It and so we great. watched it. Yeah. And anyway, there was racism in there, uh, <laughs> not what? in a overt way where you were hurting people, but you know, there was racism and stuff. But the guy, Morgan Freeman, that was playing the black man. So wait, wait, <laughs> Morgan Freeman is playing a black man. He must have had to do a lot of research for that. And also, secondly, like, they had racism, but not the violent racism. You know, like the kind of, like, you know, casual racism, like first base racism. <laughs> you know, the kind of good old boys type of racism that doesn't really hurt anybody that's white. But let me continue. Wait, who was the one that played the black man in this movie, Driving Miss Daisy? The guy, Morgan Freeman, that was playing the black man, he spoke up, he countered Miss Daisy, but he kept loving her mm -hmm. and showing her respect. And there was a scene where she was nearing the end of her life and she says, you've become my best friend. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful when people of color can really just be boiled down to anecdotes in white people's lives? I mean, I was racist most of my life, but you know, the black guy employed was nice to me because he wanted to keep getting paid. And eventually, I could call him a friend. Now, would he be my friend if I didn't keep paying him to show up at my house every day? Probably not. Is that how I define the rest of my friends? Based upon who I pay to show up? No, not really at all, but... He was a black man. He was my friend. And as Miss Daisy, at least I had one black friend in the end. Because that means... I'm not a racist, even though I paid for my only black friend to be my black friend. Oh, Andrew Womack, I wish. You know what I want next time? You've made this just so delicious. I think we need to transition from the story of, like, driving Miss Daisy to making it more like Nicholas Sparks to where, you know, no, I'm not going to go there. Sorry. <laughs> But what? Oh, it's so heartwarming when white people feel good about their racism. I love watching those films where it makes me feel like I'm not a total piece of shit. But I digress because there's a new shining star on the White House list of <laughs> faith advisors. Uh-huh. Prophet Amanda Grace. Here we go. For such a time as this is why President Trump has been raised up into this position, because it is needed. This type of leadership is needed, okay? He may have not been wanted by a lot of the nation, but he is needed for this time, for this hour. This is the reason he has gone through everything he has gone through in his life. To prop up Vladimir Putin because true what? Huh? For honestly, bite my ass when we say such a time as this. Is that not like I want to retire that phrase in Christianity for such a time as this? I know, I know, I know where it comes from in the Bible. I know. They're referring to the book of Esther. So guess what? It made sense then. And you can't use that every time. Such a time as this. Such a time as this. The sun is out today for such a time as this. <laughs> My stomach hurts a little. And I need to excuse myself to go to the restroom for such a time as this. I'm going to be a Karen to my neighbor. Oh, it, it works and it works. Okay, yes, yes, yes. So why is she on the White House's list of faith leaders? Because she says nice things 
Like, why can't I use the magical Christian, like, spell words? Hmm, let me try it here. For such a time as this, I will win a million dollars. For such a time as this. <laughs> I'm joking. I, de, wha, what? 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 Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amanda Grace, you're going to fit in just fine at the White House. You're going to do great, girlfriend. Mm hmm. Just keep saying the crazy crap you're saying. And remember, Trump is right. Everything else is wrong. And God is on Trump's side. You'll do awesome. You'll do awesome there. As long as you continue to just somehow lie to your brain, your faith, and everything else within you that gives you a human soul. If you can go ahead and kill and cancel all those things, it'll be wonderful. You'll just be like Paula White. <laughs> Paula White hasn't had a soul for two decades. Uh, oh, oh, I somehow mentioned Paula White. Oh, oh, Paula White. Guess what? Paula White's telling us we've got Trump all wrong. We've got Trump all wrong. And if it helps you any, Paula White's going to be the end of the Christian crazy of the week. You know why I'm going to just elevate her right now? Not because I'm trying to move a woman to a position of leadership here. Though I do believe women should be in positions of leadership. No, that's not why I'm doing that with Paula White. Mm -mm. Because I have, a, uh, I have an egalitarian view of the church that men and women are equal within the church. No, no, that's not why I'm doing that. Okay. Um, is, is it because I have, I have like many, many other, many, 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 as in like five or six other bits of the Christian crazy to be able to show you to, let you look at this and say, oh my God, this is not real. Is it real? It is real. Oh God, what has happened to Christianity? That, I do have others. But I'm going to show you Paula White's mainly because it's probably the best one and we've got real business to talk about today. So Paula White, Paula White, the president's number one spiritual advisor. She's going to talk to us a little bit about, hey, she's actually told the president not to divulge too much about his deep, deep faith. I mean, deep faith. Very deep. Like, his faith was like, I mean, it's pretty deep. Like, as far as it goes, like two inches deep, Stormy Daniels, that is his deep faith. What? Um, mm? okay, sorry. Go ahead. Hey, 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 Paula White. Huh? Tell me about the president's deep faith. Does he have a relationship with the Lord? Is he being mentored? A lot of people wanted to know those types of questions. He absolutely does. He grew up in a very strong household of faith. And a lot of people don't, if you look at the formation of it, his mother, as I said, was a very godly, strong, praying woman. She had a lot of influence on him. So did his father, but in very different ways. Um, you know, his father, obviously a strong businessman. So if you look, I'd say two things really formed him a lot. Um, and that was his church life. And I'll go into the explanation of that and then bring that current. And also, um, I think military school had a lot of formation on him. You can see that, you know, he is a straight shooter. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, I, I really, okay. To let you guys, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit for you to realize the Christian crazy. Uh, what I do every week when I compile these in the Christian crazy, I figure out like, you know, a, a good smattering of, of, of crazy examples for us to be able to talk through that may or may not kind of lead into the main idea of what we're talking about. But, you know, either way, it's fun, frivolity, all that stuff. And, and I actually have this thing. I, I purchased this. I purchased this in the Holy Land um, of all places when I was there years ago. And it's, it is, it's kind of like a thermometer, but it's like a BS thermometer. So, like, when I get enough, when I get enough lies in the hopper, I have to just, I have to just, like, emergency exit the Christian crazy. And, Really, within the first thirty seconds of Paula White opening her mouth, we had already we had already overcome. Like the the levees have broken. It is we're done for here. But I do love that. I oh Paula White, you do such a good job lying for the faith. Oh Trump's strong upbringing in the church and his military background. Oh look at him as. Just a little man of faith and his father, who was a good businessman, who screwed out people of color. Oh, it's all part of the good white Christians. Ascent to power. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, my goodness. Huh. 
He just kind of almost reminds me of white Jesus if white Jesus was orange. So wait, right nowadays, is it racist to be anti-orange? Anti-Loompa? I mean, I'm, I'm okay with most of the Oompa Loompas out there. I mean, Trump is just one of the rogue Loompas. So am I, am I being racist if I'm, if I'm anti-orange? If I'm anti-Agent Orange there and the POTUS? Oh, God. Oh, no. I must. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll never speak ill of President Cheeto again until the next time I do. All right. So enough of that. And I'm going to tell you, there was more crazy. There was more crazy. Rick Wiles. Oh, Rick has things to say. Mike Pence hanging out at Mike, Je uh, <laughs> not Mike, Mike Pence hanging out at Robert Jeffers Church where the whole entire choir did not decide to use face coverings. Oh my gosh, no. Tony Perkins. Oh no, God. Lori Baker, because Lori's on the air, but Jim's not on. Uh, you know, you know, you guys got the best. Just trust in your heart. You got the best of the crazy. You got the best. And the rest don't matter. Because you know all these names, they'll be around here next week to let you down. Mm -hmm. Where you're able to hear how they have figured out how to monetize and systematize the faith to where Jesus is whatever you want him to be, as long as you're making money. You know, that kind of part of the Christianity, mm -hmm, where the S's are dollar signs. <sighs> they learned a lesson I never learned years ago. All right. All right, folks. So let's refocus here. <laughs> and what I want to do is give one little shout out. One little shout out to those out there that have been in and around church. And hey, guess what, folks? This is the time of year that we can be able to say this. Coronavirus has taken so much from us. It has taken, it's taken and I'm being serious here. And then I'm going to move to something frivolous. But coronavirus has been horrible. It is, it is. <laughs> it's taken so many lives it has taken jobs and it has put us in a place that we're in a very 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 scary place um, for a lot of people in America it is the coronavirus has been able to show us that some people are insane because wearing masks has become a political issue but if there's anything good if there is anything good that has come from all of this, the one thing I can think. Now, does that one thing replace all of the bad things? God, no. <laughs> so, Stuart, really, is there a good thing? Not really. Is there a silver lining? Mm, maybe a uh, kind of chrome-plated lining? A artificial chrome-plated lining? Anyone? Anyone want to guess what that could be? Oh, hey, this is June. And you may or may not be listening to this in June or July, but guess what? Oh, <laughs> I was reading an article in prep for the show where, ah, VBS has been canceled in most places this year. Aw, sad. VBS, where is our faith without VBS? I mean, Moses talked about it and said, Jesus will come again. Finally, the day where VBS was not held in person and live streams do not count. So if there's anything good happening, VBS isn't. And if you have an issue with me saying that, you should listen to a past show from probably a year or two ago. <laughs> what the, why is VBS the thing? Enough of that. Let's hop in to our main idea. Now, I want to run you through a little bit, a little bit of where we have been at. So for the past four or five shows, uh, we have been loosely talking through this concept of power. Um, I went to Fuller Seminary, and one uh, of my probably most influential pastor or pastors, <laughs> one of my most influential professors, uh, was a man, great man named Wilmer Villacorta. And as I was going through stuff, I had read one of his books years ago, and kind of returned to it recently. And I was like, "Whoa, this kind of really fits really now." And so it was called Tug of War, and we've been talking through. A, a very loose conversation throughout the book. I have some people that are reading through the book along with us. Wilmer will we'll probably do this much better. But we are kind of roping in this in, in, a, in a loose way towards being able to talk about Jesus, what kind of kingdom he was preaching about, 
what kind of systems of ethics and power and hierarchy was he laying out? And what ultimately matters when we try to go after and grapple for power. So that's a very, very loose summary of where we have been out for the past few weeks on the show. And some of the conversations that we have had have centered around being able to get to those places um, of humility and vulnerability where we are able to uh, look at our stories, our own lives, and to be able to see where changes happen, where, where God has moved, see where our own stories have power and change, and, and that our own stories, when we own our own mistakes and we own all those vulnerable places, they can become, they can become stories of power. So we have talked through that. We've talked through the how in the past we see very uh, flawed systems of hierarchy and power throughout the churches where the few uh, rule over the many and where that's not what the kingdom of God was based around. And, and even in those conversations, we've, been, we've begun to see how even how within churches, the role of leadership seems to be seen as the head of a pastor. And we have seen that is what leadership looks like in the church because we say, look at the pastor. So today we are going um, to potentially, as I will tell you, potentially, we'll go through one article, uh, potentially two, and then hint on a myriad of others. So as I prepare for each of our shows and trying to figure out kind of what is like the vibe and what is, yeah, kind of the spirit of what we'll be talking about, I tend to find articles that either intrigue me or tend to piss me off uh, because the others in between the two don't always catch my interest. And one of these articles, this came out over the past week. This is over on June 29th on uh, the Christian Post and it's from Christian Post Voices by uh, Sam Rainier called Are You a Leader or a Commentator? And uh, what, what... We may hop into a second Christian Post article because it's always fun to be able to tear those apart too. Um, not for the sake of tearing it apart, but because I feel like some of these things end up being very weird and bad theology. Um, they may be good blog posts or blog type posts, but they're not necessarily good theology um, or reading of scripture. Now, um, this article, which I will bring to you, piss me off, was talking about trying to break down the two differences saying so essentially that there are only two kind of voices that, that come out of really like the church or media arenas. And so you are either a leader or a commentator. And so what they, what the author is trying to do here, um, is not saying that either are good or bad, but he is also trying to point out that having commentary is not leadership. And he's trying to be able to say that, yes, that, that, that though those that can call out culture, that those that call out what is happening within the church and within politics, those are commentators and those are fine, but they're not leadership within the church. And I actually want to call BS on this because as he goes through his article, so I'll, I'll give, I'll give a brief overview. And again, I may not be doing justice for the article, but in doing justice for the purpose of what I want to do with it, with, with it right now. Um, He's saying, you know, commentators have fewer filters. Leaders must act as statesmen, meaning that commentators are people that can speak openly okay, without fear of repercussion. And leaders must be statesmen because they, they, are, they, are, they are leading groups of people. They have to make sure that they are being more even-handed. Now, commentators offer outside perspective. Leaders maintain the inside perspective. Eh, I call BS on that. Commentators build an audience. Leaders inherent followers. Kind of, maybe. Commentators speak the truth today. Leaders guide people toward the future. And here's where I want to be able to to call BS on all of this. I call it BS because I'm a lazy audio editor and I would like to call it something else. But for now, we're just going to call it BS. That's the nicest way of putting this. 
So let's talk through this. So one, what he's calling commentators, um, I, I would actually, I would actually, I would actually beg to say that there are different categories in what he's trying to split apart here. I think there's a third one. I think there's commentators. I think there's leaders. And I think there's prophets. And he's trying to throw all, uh, commentators and leaders into this this weird vacuum between uh, like media and and uh, and different outlets and churches and ministries. He's trying to throw this all together to make it to where it's this very binary. And this this is a problem. I think this is a huge leadership problem within the church that we we get hung up in binaries. You're with us or you're against us. You are you are you are moving in this direction or you're moving in this direction. And, and, and we do this, and we can't do both. But see, I believe for the church to be the church, and why, and why, 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 why the, church, the church's leadership structure does not need to center around one person in a very limited hierarchy, and where normally that one person is a white man. I think we need to look at more of a different way of how we handle leadership. Now, in the past... Um, in the past shows that we've had here, we have been talking about owning our own stories. So we've been talking about the owning of the me part of our stories, meaning owning where you have come from, owning the ugly parts and the good parts, owning the victories and the failures, because they all can come together to help us be able to see who we are and this place and time. But we also talked about the fact that being able to share those stories from a position of stability also opens ourselves up in humility and vulnerability towards others. And so what I want to further descend into this idea today of moving from the me, which we've discussed, to the we. So moving from the me, my story, to the we, our collective stories, what that begins to do is it begins to deepen where we are at. It is important for us to own our own stories. That is very true. But what begins to become more and more important is when we begin to integrate those stories, weave them into the mosaic of other people's stories. Because there will be parts of your story that will connect with other people. There will be part of other people's stories that will connect with your story. And in many ways, you will be able to say, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one. Oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. Oh my gosh, this person sees it the same way. And those, oh my gosh, moments are beautiful. And those can be absolutely divine moments when we realize we are not the only one. Because we have to understand this. That our story is incomplete without these stories of others. So as we have talked about owning our own story, uh, we've learned to tell our own stories. And one thing that I think that we should be able to see when we're telling our own stories and, and owning our own journeys is the fact that they're not journeys of complete loneliness that somehow other people have filtered into your story. Good or bad, they've played roles in your story. So inherently, when I say to own your own story, you're owning your story, but other people have little, let's say, footnotes in your story. They have uh, directed your story. They have maybe oppressed your story. Or maybe they have lifted up your story. But we have to begin to see that. That our story and our meaning for how our story connects into the larger story of others is incomplete. Until we begin to connect it with others. So when we learn to share our story, the I becomes we because we share our vulnerability. And we share who we are. And as we share that, we are offering it. We are offering that, and even in a certain sense, if you could almost even say, our story, sharing our story with others, in a certain sense, is a form of communion. When we think of the Eucharist, we think of Jesus, Jesus giving himself to us, that we are able to share in this collective union with God, where God tells us that we are loved and that we are mattered where we are at. We, we, we step into the Eucharist realizing that Jesus sacrificed for us and loved us exactly where we were at. In a similar sense, in a similar sense of the Eucharist, we share of ourselves 
with others when we tell our story. We say, here is my body broken for you. Here's my blood for you. This is the meanness of me. Not meanness, meanness of me. Here's the essence of me. And in those places, our me stories slowly, slowly become we stories. And the we stories, the we stories are the stories that give us deep meaning in life. And this comes from Henry Nouwen's book, Life Signs, where he says this, gradually I began to see the simple fact that those I had feared had a great power over me. Those who could make me afraid could also make me do what they wanted me to do. People are afraid for many reasons, but I am convinced that the close connection between power and fear deserves special attention. So much power is wielded by instilling fear in people and keeping them afraid. Fear is the one of the most effective weapons in the hands of those who seek to control us. Fear is what keeps our stories in the me zone. It does not move us to the we zone. We have fear because exposing ourselves, telling our stories, is vulnerable. And the culture that we're in, we're in a culture where we only post the best pictures, right? We only say the most pithy and witty things out to everyone. We only post the choicest memes. We only show the side of ourselves that we want to show. But we are not really showing much of ourselves because we've created this type of a persona. We do this because we want to be known, we want to be accepted, but it is very scary. And it fills us with fear. And as we step from the me to the we and understanding our deeper meaning, Richard Rohr gives us this illustration. The second dome of meaning gives you myth cultural heroes, group symbols, flags, special foods, ethnicity, patriotism. These tell you that you are not alone. You are also connected to a larger story. We all know that is fantasiful, but it is shared meaning that is important. These identities run so deep that many people have died and given their lives for their group, their country, and their religious group. And there's a danger in going wholeheartedly into the we without the me. And I think that we see that right now. We see this, and especially in a lot of people that want to be able to, they want to be part of the we, the collective. And they want to do this by killing the me. And that is a very dangerous place to be in as well. Because when you wholeheartedly become part of the we, someone's controlling that we group. You need your story to anchor yourself as you step in to the collective story of others. Because if we just stay in the me, or if we just stay in the we of our stories, you're still only living part of who we are. And we begin to only live into part of who we are. We usually get kind of collected in with this weird mythology of thinking to try to fill in the gaps of what's missing in our lives. But usually we do that outside of vulnerability and humility. So it becomes something else. So it begins to morph it into something else. And very rarely is that something else something good for you or for those around you. But what I wish could happen, what I wish could ultimately happen would be this. And I know I, know I spend a lot of time on this show ripping apart American Christianity uh, because I feel like it is my duty to. Why do I feel it's my duty to? Because I love Jesus, and I'm not saying other people don't love Jesus, but I also get really frustrated at how Jesus is twisted and turned into a prop um, as opposed to being a guiding light for things. And as we said before, fear is very, very powerful. Fear has an ability to be able to warp and mutate us into being things that are less than human. But also, you know, um, it's easy to see people's fears. But oftentimes, people in power, because we're, again, we're talking about people wielding power in ways 
that are not the way it's supposed to be. But power is also wielded, or fear, I'm sorry, fear is also wielded in a way that doesn't always look fearful, but it's called control. And I love it. I love it in Mark 12 where, G, where, where Jesus is confronted with this. So John says to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone using your name to cast out demons, but we told him to stop it because he wasn't in our group. Don't stop him, Jesus said. No one who performs a miracle in my name will soon be able to speak evil from me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. And I've always loved that. I've always loved that scripture where the disciples are like, hey, 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 he doesn't have on the club shirt. He didn't pay the dues. I mean, he's out going like doing Jesus-y stuff. Like he's helping people to not be oppressed or possessed by demons and stuff. But come on, he's not paying the dues. He didn't, he doesn't have, he doesn't have, he doesn't have the ring or the badge. And Jesus is like, what the hell is wrong with you? All I'm telling you people to go out and do is be selfless and do good. Are you going to screw up? Yeah. But that's okay. You're going to learn from it. Go try to love and live as servants who are trying to change the world for the better. But the disciples didn't see it. And oftentimes we don't see it now. But he's not part of our denomination. Oh, but he likes to also, I've seen him. He likes this pastor or, or, or he wears this kind of thing here. Or, 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 or I hear he watches Raider movies or whatever else. We make excuses, but simply here's how we're going here. Jesus is like, okay, okay, folks. <laughs> huddle around, huddle around here. Now. Now, even for the simplest of you, even in the back, like you, Thomas. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's make this real, real simple. Hey, remember the whole Old Testament? Yeah. Most of that can just be summarized into something very, 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 just let, let's, let's make this very, very focused here. Okay. Love God. Uh-huh. And love others. Okay. What about enemies? Those are covered under the others. Okay. So you're really just saying that we're supposed to go and love everyone? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm lost. I, I was lost. I was lost. I was I I'm not sure. We're like where 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 does the hate come in, Jesus? Come on, this is religion. This is faith, Jesus. We know. Come on, hate killing. That's gotta happen. Where the hell is it? Uh 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 uh. We're not gonna get it perfect. We're not gonna get it perfect. I make fun of people in the Christian craze, not because they're. They're misspeaking or they're just off a little bit. No, because they're way off the rocker. This isn't talking about people that are trying in a different way or maybe not saying everything perfect. No. I think most of us listening to this show, most of us that care about anything would want to see the world in a better place where it is today. We want to see people that are not out harming others. People are not out being just disgustingly racist where people aren't starving while others are feasting. We want to be able to see something where people are just taken care of as just a basic human right and need. The message of the gospel isn't that effing hard. People, come on. God loved the world. Jesus lived sacrificially to be able to show us how we're supposed to live. He came here to be able to tell us what the kingdom of God looks like. What are its values? The kingdom of God, what does it look like? What are its values? Is that there's a big table. Everyone's got a seat. God loves you all. There's a bunch of other messed up stuff out there, but come on in here. We're just going to love you as you are. What? That's too radical. Or it's just too easy. Because again, I'm not comfortable with the religion where I can't hate someone. That's the basis of everything. And remember, you're listening to a damn show called Snarky Faith, so that was sarcasm, people. Uh-huh. Sarcasm. Is a way to pronounce it that no one ever did. Sarcasm, sorry. Because ultimately, we have to remember this. That fear doesn't have a place in the kingdom of God. Fear of others that aren't like us doesn't have a place in the kingdom of God. Distrusting others doesn't have a place in the kingdom of God. 
Calling 911 because we feel uncomfortable because there's a person of color around us doesn't have a place in the kingdom of God. Pushing past our fears, pushing past our settled insecurities does have a place in the kingdom of God. And for us to love better means we have to push past these places and in a certain sense, oh, not to be too pithy, we need to be able to crucify all of our own baggage, all of our own shit on the cross of Jesus because he says, leave all this crap behind if you're going to go out and love people. And if you don't want to go out and love people, just a heads up, you're not really going to like the kingdom of God. You might like the kingdom of churchianity, but you're not going to like the kingdom of God if you are called to go out and love people. Because that's really what it's about. In heaven, there's going to be a bunch of different people out there. There's going to be a bunch of different types of people, different viewpoints, and, and all of this. We are called to simply love others whether they are like us or they're not, whether they believe it like us or whether they are not, don't. And we are in a really weird and messed up and broken place as a faith, as a people, and as a church, but I think we can get better. I think I can, th I believe as we look with sober eyes into the mirror back at ourselves, we can begin to say, I can do better. I want to do better. I need to do better. Jesus calls me to do better. If I want to call myself a Christian, I have to do better. If I want to go to church, meh, maybe I don't need to do better. But if I really want to take what Jesus says to be true, I need to get better. I need to do better. I need to keep going on to help others do better. So before I send you guys out, I wanted to try something new. It was a little idea that kind of hatched in the back of my head, and we'll see <laughs> if it's interesting or not. But uh, uh, generally... At the end of every show, I send you guys off with grace and, and peace and snark to move into the world to go and make a change and a difference. Well, on top of that, I um, for every show, when I start recording, I kind of have, it's not necessarily what you call necessarily hype music, but I, I have music that I'll listen to to kind of get me into the frame of mind. Music that I've been listening to over the week that I feel like fits the vibe of what I wanted to talk about um, here on the show. And, and I've done this for a little while, and it was just been like a random thing that I just do for myself to get me ready to to talk and get in that the the headspace to be able to speak. But I figured that, hey, if this is something that I'm doing anyways, this might as well be a fun little part to kind of tag on to the end of the show. So what we're gonna start doing, just to see if this is a thing that needs to be a thing, um, I'm gonna begin ending you with a bit of what we're gonna call pop liturgy. And this week, as I will explain this more, that I will in the following weeks. So for this week for Pop Liturgy, what um, through our conversations on power structures and, and leadership uh, and this whole idea of us getting better, uh, I'm taking this liturgy this week from, from two different songs. And this is I Want to Get Better by Bleachers and Recovery by Frank Turner. You can look those up on your own. But I've kind of used some of those lyrics and some of those words to kind of form just a basic liturgy that I feel like kind of is a little bit of a bow on the end that we're tying here on the end of the show and a little bit of a kind of thought to enter you all into the week. But hey, we good for this? We cool with this? So, all right. I introduced to you a new segment we're going to try out here. Pop liturgy. So here's your pop liturgy for the week of June 29th. I didn't know I was lonely until I saw your face. I want to get better. I didn't know I was broken until I wanted to change. I want to get better. You once sent me a letter that said, if I'm lost at sea, close your eyes and catch the tide, my dear, and only think of me. Well, darling, now I'm sinking, and I'm as lost as lost can be. And I was hoping you could drag me up and down here towards my recovery. 
if you could just give me a sign, just a little glimmer. Some suggest that if you'd have me, I could only make me better. Then I would stand a little stronger as I walk a little taller all the time. Because I know you are a cynic, but I think I can convince you. Because broken people can get better if they really want to. Or at least that's all I have to tell myself. I'm hoping to survive. It's a long road to recovery from here. A long way back to the light. A long road to recovery from here. A long way to making it right. Lord, move us this week into the light. Lord, teach us to be better. Teach us that getting better is better. And show us that we are only better when we are better together. I send you out into this world with the holiest amount of grace and snark and peace. Go out and be yourselves. Be amazingly yourselves. And I will catch you again next week. I'm out of here. Peace!